I've been contrasting the grace of God with the Old Testament law and punishment of God. And some people think I'm against the law. But I'm not. The law is good if you use it lawfully. There is a right and a wrong use of the law. And we're going to talk about that on our program today. So stay tuned for the gospel truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I am continuing a series that I started last week talking about the true nature of God. And I tell you, I am excited over this teaching. This is something that uh, was pivotal in my life. I had an experience where God revealed that His love for me was unconditional. And I knew it. I experienced it. It came at a time when I had just seen how unworthy I was relative to God. Now, relative to people, I've lived a very moral life. But it's just like God pulled away the blinders and all of a sudden I saw myself in the presence of a holy God. And I recognized that, man, I was undone, like Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6. Woe is unto me. I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You know, that's just old English for saying Isaiah recognized that, man, compared to God, he was unworthy, unholy. And that revelation came to me. And then immediately upon me understanding that and repenting of it, I experienced a supernatural unconditional love of God flowing through me. And I knew it wasn't based on any goodness of mine. And so that was my experience. And I knew this. But you know, all of my head, everything I'd ever been taught was that God loved me proportional to how well I performed. If I prayed and didn't get a prayer answered, it was because I hadn't been doing this right or doing that right. And I was in constantly trying to barter and negotiate with God. That God, I'll... I promise you I'll serve you more, I'll study the Word more, I'll be better if you'll just do this for me. And so my experience went totally contrary to all the way that I've been taught. And you may have never sat down and verbalized things the way I've just described, but you know what, there's many people that this is what your experience is. If you'd think about it, God has been nothing but good to you, and yet all of your theology is that if you do badly, then God rejects you. There's punishment. You're afraid of rejection, and yet God has never rejected you. He's never been unfaithful to you, and yet you're fearful of it. There's this conflict between what most of us have experienced from God and what we think the Word says. And that's where I was, and it took me about 20 years to understand through the Word of God how that all of our sins have been dealt with and put upon Jesus. God placed His wrath upon Jesus so that I would never suffer any punishment or rejection. And that ushered in a new covenant, a new contract, a new way of God dealing with mankind. And because of that, there is a huge difference between this new covenant and the old covenant. And I really struggled in my relationship with God because I had tried to mix the two. I believe that most of what's called Christianity today does not have a clear understanding of the difference between relating to God under the old uh, performance-based covenant versus the new grace covenant. Most people don't understand that. And so that's what this teaching is all about, is what is God really like? Is He like the God of the Old Testament where if you pick up sticks on the Sabbath day, He's going to kill you for violating a command about keeping the Sabbath? Or is He the God of the New Covenant where Jesus literally forgave a woman who was taken in the very act of adultery and didn't punish her? I mean, is it the punishment over the slightest little thing, the way the Old Testament portrays it, or is it this grace that Jesus portrayed where he fellowshiped with publicans and harlots and sinners? Which is it? Will the real God please stand up? That's what we ministered on last week. And one of the main things that I established was that there is a huge difference between the Old Covenant and the new covenant. God has changed his dealings with mankind. Not because God has changed, but because we have changed. We can now be born again through Jesus and literally become a brand new species of being that never existed before. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. 
When we got born again, we now have a relationship with God that isn't based on performance, but it's based on our acceptance of Jesus, the payment for our sins. And they couldn't have that under the old covenant. Jesus hadn't died for our sins. So they couldn't be saved in the sense that we are. And therefore God did impute their sins unto them. But it says in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing man's trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We have a different covenant established upon better promises than the old covenant and because of it we have a brand new avenue, a brand new way of approaching God that I feel that the vast majority of Christians have missed because they haven't had this scriptural truth presented unto them about how we're delivered from the Old Testament law. So last week, that's what I spent the whole week showing examples of how Jesus would have rebuked Elijah had he have been present in his physical body, earthly ministry in 2 Kings chapter 1. He would have rebuked Elijah for calling fire down out of heaven because that's what he did to his disciples when they wanted to do what Elijah did. There's a different way of dealing with people under the new covenant than under the old covenant. This is why we don't go in and any longer just kill entire races of people the way that God commanded in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, those people could not be changed. They had given themselves over so strongly to demonic powers that the Lord literally had to wipe out these demonic races because their poison, this evil, would have corrupted the human race. So God just said, wipe them all out. Same thing with like children. There's a scripture that says that if a child curses his father or mother, that the father and mother are supposed to stone him to death. That's the Old Testament law. Under the New Testament, we don't stone our children to death for rebellion. If we did, there'd be a lot less people around today. I guarantee you there's a lot of teenage rebellion and it's wrong today to go back to the Old Testament scripture and say, based on this scripture, I'm going to kill you for what you did. Did you know if you did that today, you would be thrown in jail, you'd be prosecuted and rightfully so. So some people think, well, has God changed? No, but you know what? We have changed. Under the old covenant, once a person gave themselves over to demonic things and gave Satan that kind of an inroad, they couldn't be transformed. They couldn't be born again and changed in their nature the way that we can be today. And so because of the grace of God and because of what Jesus has purchased for us, we deal with sin differently than it was dealt with under the Old Testament. Now, is that to say that it didn't sin anymore? No, things are still right and wrong. But the punishment and the rejection and especially this just total annihilation because people couldn't be changed is now over and we can now minister to a murderer, to a person who's insulted their parents, a person who's committed adultery, and we can see that person forgiven and changed, and so we don't kill them anymore for committing the sins that they were commanded to be killed for in the Old Testament. There's a difference between the New Testament grace and the Old Testament law. So that's what I spent all week long talking about. This week what I want to do is just start showing you from Scripture things that are said about the Old Testament law. And I've said this a number of times, but it bears repeating that you need to let the Bible affect your theology. Some people just don't let the Bible have any impact at all on what they believe. They believe what they believe because this is just how they feel or this is what they've heard somebody else say or it's tradition, it's what their grandparents said. All of those are not right reasons to believe a certain thing. You need to go to the Word and do what Romans chapter 3 verse 4 says, and that is, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. You need to get to a place to where God's Word gets in the way of your theology. And so I'm going to share some scriptures with you that tell you what the purpose of the law is. You know, some people hear me teaching on these things and they think, so you're against the law. You're against the old covenant. You believe that part of the Bible doesn't apply and that we aren't, you know, it's of no profit to us. Nope, that's not what I believe. And some people say, well, you've been saying that we're now under a new covenant that we don't have to punish people and kill people anymore and do all of this. Yes, I believe that. There's still benefit to the Old Testament law. I believe that the law is good if you use it 
for what it was intended to do. But see, here's a major difference. Most people believe that God gave the law to show us what we needed to do to be in right standing with Him. And in a sense, that's correct. But here's the reason that God gave it. Not so that you could keep it. Because nobody can keep the Old Testament law. And some of you may be appalled and a shock, but if you say that you can keep the Old Testament law, then you're deceived. Nobody can keep the Old Testament law. It, the reason God gave it is to show us that it is so far out of our reach to ever earn relationship with God that it would make us, make us despair of self-righteousness and it would just bring us to a place of, God, if this is what you expect, I can't do it. God, have mercy on me. It's like a person, you know, who's trying to high jump and if you had, if you had a bar placed, say, three feet off of the ground. There's a lot of people that could step over that. Certainly, I believe just about everybody could jump over that. And if that was the standard, there's a lot of people think, I can do that. But God just raised the bar so high. It's like a hundred feet high that nobody, nobody, nobody can ever reach that goal. And God did that to say, this is the minimum standard. So quit trusting in yourself and quit trying to earn it and instead just ask for forgiveness and receive it as a free gift. That was the logic behind the Old Testament law. It was to give us such a strict standard that nobody could ever live up to it and they would ask for mercy. But instead, religion is turned around and said, Oh, thank you, Father, for showing me all that I must do. And then they preach, do this and this and this. And nobody can do it. They've totally misapplied the law. So I still believe the law is good if we use it correctly. So I was talking about how that there's nothing wrong with the law if you use the law correctly. But the problem has been that we have used the law to try and accomplish or obtain right standing with God through the keeping of the law. That wasn't the purpose of it. The purpose of the law was to condemn you and show you how incapable of earning right standing with God you were so that you would be removed from this deception of self-righteousness. Boy, that's a mouthful, and some of you I know missed that, but that, that is not understood by most people today. Now again, the term law, a lot of people think, well, I don't offer animal sacrifices, and I don't keep the Passover, and I don't observe you know, all of these rituals, so I'm not into the law. Law is just simply saying that you've got to do one, two, three, four steps, one through seven, or whatever, how many steps you put on it, to, in order to have God do this. I'm going to do this, and then I, if I do this, God will do that. That's law. True Christianity is God doing everything for us through Jesus and saying it's all yours. All you've got to do is accept Jesus and make Him your personal Savior. You have to put faith in Him and not faith in yourself. Now, if you will do that, then... All of these things you're desiring come as a result of relationship with God, not a way to obtaining relationship with God. Boy, that is a huge difference. I just pray that God give you an understanding of this. That's simple, but it's profound. Here's a scripture I want to share with you out of 1 Timothy chapter 1. And in verse 8, it says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Now, let me back up just a couple of verses and read some scriptures here because he had just said in the previous verses, talking about how that the law is not a good thing if you use it incorrectly and how it does nothing but bring condemnation and problems in a person's life. And so, let me just back up and read this. In verse 5, this is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Boy, this is so descriptive of us today. This vain jangling is just talking about that they're just, they're just saying things. They don't even know what they're saying. You know, I'm a minister on television. And so I don't mean to be critical of other people, but in a sense, I am one of those. And I feel like I have a right to maybe criticize television ministers more than some do. 
because uh, I'm a part of that group and so I'm not condemning them in the sense that I think they're all of the devil. But I tell you what, I have watched some Christian programming and I have watched people and when they get through, I don't even know what they were saying. All it was was smoke and mirrors, noise, shouting. And I've watched people, you know how they show the audience and they'll come to a person and the person's yes and amen and, and I'm wondering, what are they yesing? What are they? They didn't say anything. It's just like if you go glory to God duh, and put an A on the end of everything, then it gets people <laughs> excited. I actually had a friend of mine in Salt Lake City who one time recognized that his denominational group he was associated with had just become a lot religious. It was just religion. It wasn't reality. There wasn't substance to it. And so he had been convicted of this and he thought he'd just do a little experiment. And so he got up in front of his church and he got up there and, I mean, worked him up into a lather, had the little organ playing in the background and hitting these notes when he came to certain things. And he got up and he started screaming and shouting and said, Mary had a, a little lamb. And he started going through this. His fleece was white as snow. And he started going through this thing. He said by the time he got through with that poem, people were running the aisles, shouting and screaming. And then he stopped and he said, do you realize that you just got excited over this poem? Mary had a little lamb. He said, you're nothing but religious hypocrites. And uh, they sobered up in a hurry. And he used that to make a point. And I know some of you are upset at me. I don't mean to do people damage, but you know what? You've got to point out some things, that there is so much hype. That's what this is talking about, jangling. Is, that would be the modern-day equivalent. They're just saying things. They're going through the motions. They scream. They yell. they got the raspy voice. They do whatever, but there's no content to it. They're just, they don't even know what they're saying. And in verse 7 it says, They desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Boy, isn't that true. I've heard people before say, I believe you've got to live holy. I believe you've got to keep the law. I believe you've got to do this for God to bless you. And I go up to those same people and I say, So, are you holy? Do you keep the law? Do you do everything right? And they'll say, well, I do the best I can. I said, that's not what I asked. I said, do you keep the law? Do you keep all of it? Do you do everything? Right? And, and, you know, ultimately you back them into a corner and they say, no, I don't. And I said, so you're preaching something that you can't live and you're condemning other people by doing so. You're condemning yourself. And you know what? If you follow that logic that I'm giving right here, you can take people who are desiring to be teachers of the law and you can tell them, you know what? You don't even know what you're saying. You don't know what you're affirming. You're preaching something that you can't live. That's exactly what these verses are saying. Some of you don't like what I'm saying because it's void your tradition, but it's exactly the truth and this is the modern day equivalent of what this old English text is saying here in the King James Version. Then it says in verse 8, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. In other words, there is a right and a wrong use of the law. What is the wrong use of the law? The way that it's being used today in most churches to say if you don't do this and this and this, God won't bless you. Or if you do this and this and this, God is going to judge you and punishment is coming upon you. That is law and that is a wrong use of the law. So what is right use of the law? It says in verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Well, who is a righteous man? Again, religious terminology and cliches get in the way of us understanding this. But this is just basically talking about a person who is in right standing with God because they've made Jesus their Lord. If you are born again and if your sins are forgiven, you are a righteous man or woman. And so the law isn't made for a righteous man. The law was not made for a believer. That's what it's saying. 
It says, The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for disobedient, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for man-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, etc. Basically, this is saying that the law isn't made for a New Testament Christian. It was made for a lost man for what purpose? To show them their lostness so that they would quit trying to uh, be in right standing with God or under the deception that God was just going to somehow or another turn the other way and overlook their sins. No, the law was to show us how deadly sin was, how it defiled us, and to amplify the transgression so that we would turn to God for mercy. That's the purpose of the law. And if you use the law for that purpose then you know what? It's okay. The problem has been, we haven't been using the law to show unbelievers their need for God. We've been using the law to show believers how God is angry at them and how God won't bless them if they don't do this and this and this. The law isn't made for a New Testament Christian. It was made for a lost person who before they get born again. Man, that's powerful. That is an awesome revelation. Once you come to Jesus, all of your sins, past, present, and even future tense sins, have already been forgiven. I tell you, you need to understand this, that once you come to Jesus, all of your sin has been forgiven, and God is not dealing with you based on your adherence to or failure to adhere to a set of rules. He deals with you solely based on Jesus. If Jesus is truly your Lord, if you have committed your life unto Him, then you are are in right standing with God. God has accepted you. He's pleased with you in spite of how sorry you are. Man, that's nearly too good to be true news. You know, let me give you an example that I was in Houston, Texas. This has been 25 or 30 years ago. I was holding a meeting. There was probably, I was in a Holiday Inn. There was probably two or three hundred people there. And a man in the hotel was walking by while I was preaching, he stopped and listened for a while. Then he came in, sat down in the back. And while I was preaching, he stood up and yelled at me and told me all these things. And he was high on dope or something. I couldn't reason with him, so I just commanded him to sit down and shut up. And he just sat down. I finished the service. At the end of the service, he came forward, and I started telling him about the love of God. But this guy said, I don't need that. I am God. I am holy. I am God. And this guy was just whacked out and totally messed up. You know what I did? I started telling him about the love of God, but when I saw that he thought he was God, which I knew he didn't believe that at a heart level, he was into this mind game, you know what I did? I used the law for the purpose it was intended. I took scripture and beat this guy to a pulp. I showed him how ungodly he was, how that he was a stink in the nostrils of God. He wasn't even worth spitting on. And I used the law to beat this guy to nothing. And when just moments, he was there crying, Oh, God, have mercy on me. That's the purpose of the law. But once it comes to the Lord, you don't do that anymore. Now you tell him about...